Welcome to another of our Wednesday Yawning Legends. How fun it is to be here today. Let's see a little bit about our future speakers. I want to come by in May because Steve Tashia, the chairman of the America's Cup Hall of Fame Selection Committee, will be here to talk all about uh, that process and their activities. And also in May, we'll have Ron Holland come by and talk about his new book, Sailing by the Seat of My Pants, which is pretty exciting. Uh, in uh, April 28th, we will have um, two great women sailors from our club, Olympic medalist Pam Healy and Nicole Brault will be here to talk all about engaging women through sailing. Um, uh, on April 11th, Bob McLaughlin will be here to talk about his new book, um, the Capture of U-Boat 505, an incredibly harrowing book. I'm reading it right now about this incredibly important mission. They actually got the German codes, um, which changed the Battle of the Atlantic in this raid. Um, and next week, as a special treat, we inserted the recent Oscar-winning documentary film producer, Jim Schwartz, who is, yes, also a member of our club. His uh, incredibly hot boats uh, have been uh, dazzling our eyes for some length of time, and he'll be here to talk all about uh, this other activity they have with Impact Partners, their, in, their activity to produce now 90 documentary movies which will have a social impact and, in their words, change the world. And their most recent film that just won the Oscar was Icarus about the methodical nationwide uh, doping system that the Soviets and the Russians had created uh, and affected um, athletes for the last several decades. Um, just before we talk a little bit about today's speaker, I want to introduce some special folks who are here. First and foremost, the Commodore of the St. Francis Yacht Club, Teresa Brander. It's particularly appropriate that Teresa is, in fact, the first female Commodore in our club's history. Um, that's very significant acknowledgement. Nextly, we have um, the reigning, uh, defending national match racing champion here, Nicole Brolt. Nicole. <laughs> defending national women's match racing champion. And we have staff Commodore Kimball Livingston, who's written about all these things. Kimball, welcome, buddy. Now, our format today is going to be that we're going to hear from Jocelyn, and she will see some slides that she just saw today for the first time in decades, part of the fun of it all. Um, and then uh, we have a team of other people who've been collaborating. They've made a movie, uh, Oleg and Kat. Oleg, where is Oleg? Okay, Oleg, Heron Carr and Kat. Kat, stand up, please. His incredibly able assistant. They've made a movie not yet released about Jocelyn, and we'll get to see the trailer. This will be the premiere of the trailer. We'll get to see the trailer of that movie. They've now made, this is your fifth one, uh, or fourth, fifth one? This will be the sixth movie they've made. Their um, incredible production company is going methodically about San Francisco. Um, they've done one on Hank Isom, one on Ron McCannon. They've done several others, and this is going to be the first on a female, and it'll, of course, be Jocelyn. Um, a little bit about our speaker today. And we're going to basically see that, and then we'll do the Q&A session, and we'll include um, Jocelyn's most significant of all mentors, Jimmy DeWitt, our own Mallory Award-winning <laughs> Jimmy DeWitt. Jimmy. <laughs> include in our Q&A session. Um, imagine 1951. Those of you who are old enough to remember it, well, there was our speaker having built the boat she would first sail on. That is to say they built a Mercury on 10th Street in Berkeley before she'd ever, ever, ever been on a boat before. This is the kind of person we're talking about. Built the Mercury with her husband then, Gordy Nash Sr., and got on the boat and went sailing for the first time in 1951. 
right away she took to this game and joined the Richmond Yacht Club in 1953. And we want to recognize that we are akin to all the other people who were crazy enough to race in an obsolete form of transportation. That is to say, us. We should thank and welcome with our open hearts our friends from the Richmond Yacht Club. Let's do so here. Would you stand up, members of the Richmond Yacht Club, please? Our brethren, our brethren in crime here, members of Richmond, bravo. Well, please welcome our, our friends from the Richmond Yacht Club. Our friends, our great friends. Thank you. And do we have, if I understand it correctly, we have four generations of Richmond. Madam Commodore? Is that correct? Four generations of Richmond Yacht Club members here present. It's wonderful. So she joined that esteemed and great partner Yacht Club of ours in 1953. And then in 1954, she went on her first ocean race. And as a young kid who learned to sail in 57 and go on my first ocean race that same year, I can tell you there were so few women on the waterfront. There were so few women on sailboats that when you and I as a young boy saw her, it was like a pretty kind of amazing thing, frankly. In 1955, she sailed on her first Transpac as a full member of a five-person crew. And those of you who've sailed to Hawaii, let me see some hands on people who've raced to Hawaii. So a five-person crew means she was full on because there's only five of you. And depending on the watch system you had, two of you were up all the time on the boat. So if you're one of five sailing the boat from here, there, you know, you basically are a member of the crew. In, in 1958, she got a 110. I had a 210 uh, two years later. And uh, they're crazy, fast, silly, beautiful, gracious, little, small uh, boats that can plane on a wave. And uh, she was sailing that uh, in these parts. And then in 1961, she made a pivotal move in her life. She went to work for one Jimmy DeWitt in a, a bunker over there in Richmond. I think they called it a Quonset hut, or what did you call it in those days, Jimmy? It was a Quonset hut. World War II had left us with these kinds of pieces of metal all over the Bay Area, and, and Jimmy used one to found his uh, sail loft, and he had the wisdom to bring her with him. And uh, she would change his life as much as he hers. We know that Jimmy's the first West Coaster to win the Mallory Cup. And that, just to be clear, technically is the men's amateur keelboat championship. And he did it with a woman on the boat. He did with this woman. With this woman on the boat. And to tell it as Jimmy has to me several times, and we're going to get to hear more about him later on, it's not that she was on the boat. It's that she organized that we would go. <laughs> she organized the boat, and she told him he had to get out and start racing if he's going to sell sails because he needed to build up his reputation. So it was in her guidance that they went off to the Mallory Cup and won the doggone thing. At any rate... Um, I want you to recognize that we have the opportunity. One of the joys of this uh, committee is that we get to meet such great people. Um, and it is every now and then that we get to meet people who've changed history. We're not just going to be hearing today from a great sailor, an award-winning sailor, but we're going to hear about a, from a pioneer because she actually changed the sport. When I was a young kid in my late teens and 20s, and you saw Jocelyn Nash, whose name was very strong at that time. She was incredibly pretty. And I know this is 2018, but I'm going to say it. She was incredibly beautiful. And she was incredibly smart. And she could sail. <laughs> Unbelievable. It was like heaven. If you're a 20-year-old kid, and you see a woman who is unbelievably beautiful and smart. And she could sail the pants off any boat she got on it, sail like crazy and beat you. Please welcome Jocelyn Nash. Good afternoon. It's really such a pleasure to be here and see all of you and see so many old friends. I've had a lot of fun coming over here to St. Francis over the years. I, I think that Ron uh, is a little too generous about my looking so good. 
it was a little, it's always hard to look good when you sail. And when you're wet, it does, it's hard. <laughs> One of my fondest. Uh, Pick the next slide to answer that question. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> these slides are confusing me. <laughs> One of my first memories of here, one of my strongest memories is uh, what, uh, back in about 1951 or 52. No, it was later. Um, now tell me, she's being polite. Is this a I, I want to be the judge. Let me ask you, is this a beautiful woman? I was not exaggerating at all. I always like being around the boys. <laughs> and I, I used to sail with a shower cap on. And one of our 110 friends said that he had to apologize to his wife that I was the only other woman he had ever seen in a shower cap. <laughs> but I, I did take care of my golden locks. <laughs> um, one, of, one of the mem memories I had of being here back in about 1958 or 60, early, late, late 50s or 60, we had an SYRA, a small yacht racing association, and we had uh, a race here, and St. Francis was part of that. And uh, they opened the men's bar. I mean, we were used to seeing that sign that said, no women allowed. But they opened the men's bar on this occasion so women could go in. And this memorable moment was one of the ladies came in and sat down and suckled her baby in the men's bar. <laughs> I don't know what your wonderful new Commodore would say about that, but <laughs> uh, we had a lot of women who were in small boats and we would go out and do a race and then come in and take care of our children. My oldest son, Gordy, is over there at the bar. Hiya. <laughs> and Gordy's picture is on the slide I'm seeing right here now. And I, I think that we, I also had a picture of Gordy lashed to the back of the Mercury, arm, arms and feet in diapers. And if ever there was a recipe for making a kid hate sailing, that would be it. But Gordy likes it pretty just fine. It's been his whole life, and he's awfully good. Anyway, uh, we, when, uh, let's see, where I was I? Oh, that's hard to get that out of my mind. I've, I've got to compliment you on having a woman Commodore. Times have changed. There's still a lot of room to go, but you've gone a long way, and uh, this club is wonderful. Let's see. There I am trying to steer a boat. Uh, going to Hawaii, I remember before, we, before going to Hawaii, I overheard someone ask our skipper, Roy Elliott, why are you taking a woman when the going gets tough? the woman will let you down. And, of course, that was quite a challenge. It made me mad, but I didn't let anybody down. And when I got to Hawaii the first time and felt like I'd carried my weight all the way, it kind of changed my life. It made me feel very self-confident. It was a great feeling, and uh, I'll never forget it. Some of the most fun I had in sailing was with uh, Gordy in our 110. We, we, were, we went trance back in 55 and 57. And in 57, our host over there was the 110 fleet in Hawaii. 
and they had been told we were going to arrive in Hawaii uh, like at 10 o'clock in the morning, but we didn't get in until about 5 o'clock at night. And boy, we had some really toasted hosts because they'd been waiting all day for us. And uh, But we had a lot of fun with the 110 fleet over there and came back here and got a 110 and raced it and had eventually, uh, say in 1963, we won the 110 Nationals that were held here on the bay. And it's funny, the sailors from the East Coast came out and said that they were sure that when it blew 25 out here, it was harder than the 25 back where, where they were sailing. So it was the old feeling that San Francisco Bay is a tough place to sail. Uh, we also had the Mallory Cup, going to the Mallory Cup. Boy, that was, that was wonderful. And we won that because Jimmy is just a hell of a good sailor. And nowadays you have uh, coaches and people teaching these kids all these things, but Jimmy figured it all out for himself. And when we went back east, they were, I don't know, they seemed to still think that out here we were just cowboys and Indians. And we won the tune-up race for the Mallory's, and that's usually the kiss of death. But we won the tune-up race, and I think we won the first race. But we were leading from the very beginning all the way through, and ultimately just won at the very end. And Jimmy was so cool. <laughs> uh, one of the best parts of that was something that... Well, I think any of you ladies would have done the same thing. But we had a trophy presentation out by the Naval Academy somewhere, and we were right over the water, and I got thrown in a few times. And then a gentleman named Stuart Walker, who many of you may have heard of, he was on the race committee. And Stuart Walker was all dressed up in a white shirt and a tie and his little blue knickers. And he came up about this high on me. <laughs> and he said he wanted to hug the, uh, the winning crew. And he put his arms around me, and I put my arms around him. And I looked down at the water, and I looked at him. <laughs> and I went. <laughs> and we both went in the water. <laughs> and... Uh, I don't know, on the way down, I was wondering whether it was a very good idea. <laughs> but, but when we came out of the water, he splashed me a little bit, and I knew it was okay. And so I, I don't remember much about the individual races, but I sure remember that part. <laughs> so um, we, the bullship race was one of the best, is one of the best races around here. And you all know that. Uh, I hope to see more women do the bullship race from now on. But there's a picture here that shows a trophy presentation. And in one of the earliest bullship races, I went in my El Toro. And I wasn't a very good El Toro sailor, but Gordy Rule encouraged me to go in it. So I just followed him and stayed close behind him, and he was good enough to win or be first or second. I was right behind him. And they had a, a trophy that was a big thing with horns, a, like a big Texas longhorn. And this is a picture of, of me. I don't know where, where we are on the screen. But anyway, I'm looking at a picture here when I, I got the horns for being the first woman. And that was a, another great moment. But the person who, trof who presented the trophy was a lady named Tempest Storm. <laughs> and, you know, what goes around comes around. 
Well, uh, nowadays, uh, there's somebody, some stormy lady. And, no, uh, on, on the news. So our, the tempest storm that pre- presented me with this uh, used to be a stripper over on T.I. <laughs> and, and she looked at, at the horns, and she was very buxom, and she said that she had to have a little humility. So for several years, the uh, early El Toro races had Tempest Storm as one of the people who went along and, and saw the event. And... <laughs> Anyway, it's so much fun seeing so many of you women here. Now, when I started sailing, there were just very few women. We all, let's see, I got up in van. Um, oh, here's, here's Gordy again and his brother Chris. This must have been before we did a trans spec. Anyway, I think Gordy and I were able to build boats and show and hatch babies pretty fast. <laughs> we had a full set of grandparents, fortunately, take care of them. And, oh, I, I'm just so impressed with all your ladies. You all know so much more these days than we did at the equivalent at the same age. Oh, yeah, bullshit race. This, uh, hmm? <laughs> um, the, let's see. Times were very different. I was just thinking some things were so different on the bay. When I first started sailing, it was a lot of it was one design sailing on the bay, but they were all big old wooden boats. And the first boat that I sailed on out of this club was a boat designed by Jimmy DeWitt's dad. It, his, and uh, it was uh, a sunset. He, he designed the sunsets and the acorns, and those were all wooden boats. That's before they started growing plastic trees. <laughs> And uh, I remember when, we were, when I first started sailing, they were starting to build the first plastic boat, uh, a bounty, over in Sausalito. And I, I think that boat is still around someplace. But all the other boats, it seemed like, on the bay were wooden. And you really had, when you had big boats sailing, you really had big boats out there. And... Uh, we, let's see, I, I remember the early big boat series. You had Orient and Baruna and Bolero, and I, I can't think of all the other names. I, I could five minutes ago, but. And there still were not hardly any women sailing. And, but one problem it was always fun. I'd come in here, and there was only one shower in the ladies' room. And that could be a problem as more women started sailing. And I remember we solved it over at Richmond. <laughs> we, we got our shower room at Richmond. One day, I had had a few vodka martinis. We drank a little vodka in those days. And I... I was still wet and cold after sailing, so I went in the men's head and took a shower. And we had a shower in the ladies' head within two weeks. <laughs> right. But those batters are in good hands now here. But again, seeing so many of you and ladies that I know who sail. And nowadays, the big difference, women have some purchasing power. People like Cindy have boats of their own, 
And that's a big step forward. Sue Beckett has a boat of her own, Sue Alexander. A lot of our ladies, uh, Jennifer, and that little match racing lady I'm so impressed with. My goodness. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Some of the things that are so dear. Oh, I know. When I started sailing again, when the, we had two newspapers, two morning papers in San Francisco, an examiner and a San Francisco Chronicle. And the day before the first race, which was the Hearst Regatta, they'd say 50,000 excited eyes are watching these boats on the bay. I don't know where they would put 50,000 people around here. But then there was a little guy named Jack Schmolly who would report on all these races. And Jack was kind of a, a warmed-over horse race reporter. And he would kind of turn the races into horse race reports. And he would talk about uh, oh, I can't remember some of the ways he would put it, but it was really weird. But you never got the results for about two weeks. And there were a few few very good sailors who would come in, and you'd ask them how they would do. And they'd say, oh, we, we wasted them. We were so far ahead we couldn't see their numbers. And some sailors, I remember Bruce Eason, Scott's dad, built a wonderful reputation by doing that, because the results wouldn't come out in the paper for about two weeks, and by the and you'd find out that the person got sixth or eighth. <laughs> it was a great way to get a, be, a good sailing reputation, though. <laughs> and things were so different. They, uh, you know, we didn't have the area where Golden Gate Yacht Club is now. That wasn't there, and the the road ended by the ma the big statue down there, and that just got built. Seems like within my remembrance, and I'm I'm looking around, I'm seeing so many people I sailed with. I'm seeing Mike Alexander, <laughs> and Mike and Laura. We we all sailed together a lot. And I remember one night, we I think we had won the uh, oh one one of the night races, midnight moonlight marathon or something, and we went into Golden Gate Yacht Club, and I think either either Mike or Bill Travis figured that they had a right to go into the open up the bar. It was like three in the morning, three or four, and I think we got more of their alcohol. That way, I mean, a lot of alcohol was involved. <laughs> and one of the one of the most memorable times, I mean, women. It seemed like women started sailing about ten years after I did, and I started seeing more and more on the bay. And by 1981 or 82. Sherry Wilson put together a woman's crew, uh, that, and we sailed in the big boat series with that. And we had the best time. It was very good. Jaron Leet here had an awful lot to do with our getting out there. But we did a very credible job. I think our most fun was the day that there wasn't much wind, and we, they had a postponement for a couple of hours. And... Uh, the boats were milling around, and uh, in those days, the reckless thing you could do would be drop your drawers. And uh, so we were saluted by some of the boats, by the boys, a lot. <laughs> uh, I remember Joan Burley, who many of you might know, was explained that it was not her first barbecue. <laughs> and uh, so... Anyway, when we did sail, we sailed the whole whole big boat series that year. We didn't do very well, but we didn't hit anybody. 
and we didn't commit any fouls, and we had a couple of great knockdowns. I remember that. I was staring, and some of the things that are still the same on the bay is there's places here that are very dangerous, like there's that jive point around behind Alcatraz going downwind down to good old Blossom. But in those days, more of the races were just around the government marks. They weren't uh, so many as where you're putting out marks. So you're doing a lot much better racing these days than we did in those days, but we were just learning. And uh, I don't, I keep seeing these funny slides and I, I just saw them today here. I, I, we had, oh, there they are. Oh, that's, that's our hawk farm. Um, getting out in the bay, I didn't really know I was doing anything wonderful when I was out there. I just didn't want to have to stay home all the time and take care of kids. I mean, they were very nice kids, but... <laughs> But anyway, uh, uh, eventually I got hold of a hawk farm, and we did a lot of racing in that. And uh, Laura and uh, was on one of the first hawk farms, and she was a great little sailor. And we have some, some of our best ladies from Richmond are here today. But it's just been so much fun, and uh, I think hawk uh, sailing is a wonderful sport for women because you can use your intelligence, and women can focus and concentrate and commit to something and do it well. And we're seeing that now. I remember when Liz Bayless started sailing. She's, uh, she's 20 years younger than me, at least. Uh, but Liz was one of the first women who acted like a man on a boat. She could curse like a man, and she could get things done. And uh, right recently, we've been having an awful lot of fun on Cindy Lou's green boat. And oh, I, I, I just can't tell you how much. It means to me to be here and seeing so many women interested because you don't have to be on the water all the time to be interested in sailing and contribute to the sport and contribute to encouraging other women to go sailing. But the best place to start is on small boats. And we have a lot of active El Toros over at Richmond and there's opties at a lot of the boats and all the other small boat sailing you're doing here, your J-22s, it's just wonderful. I guess I can stop talking now. <laughs> so. Thank you so much, Jocelyn. Well, Jocelyn... You up the video. <laughs> Go get a seat. Okay, so we're going to now see a video uh, made by um, Oleg Harinkar. One of the great um, fun aspects of sailing at San Francisco Bay is the ecosystem of support people and um, helpers. Uh, in the in our game and uh, Oleg and his partner Don Zimmer and their able uh, uh, artistic incredibly good helper cat um, co-producer have produced this now I guess this is about to be this is your sixth one Oleg your sixth video and uh, so we're now going to see this is the premiere preview of the five minute trailer on uh, sailing set her free the story of Jocelyn Nash Tommy
I go way back because I'm 88 and a half now. It didn't occur to me at the time that I was doing any groundbreaking activity, but I didn't want to have to stay home and take care of kids. And I really wanted to go out and sail. I didn't realize what the rest of the culture was doing. What I did was sail, and uh, I loved it. The biggest first turning point in my life was meeting Gordon Nash. I had a terrible crush on him. And if Gordy would say, jump, Jocelyn, I would say, how high, sir? You know, it was that bad. In about 1958, Gordon Nash decided to buy a 110, an international 110, the double-ended boat. So we raced the 110, and the 110 fleet was the hot fleet at that time. And all the good young sailors that were coming up were sailing on 110s, and we were part of that. That was one of the most fun times of my life, racing the 110. But then Gordy sold the boat, and I thought that that was probably that was a bad turning point. Where is that Lord? There. I can't see Lord. I was determined to take any sailing opportunity that came along. I wanted to steer, I wanted to helm. Divorces don't happen just suddenly. You know, they take a while. I wanted to go to Southern California midwinters and uh, that was when Gordon moved out. And I remember thinking that was great because then I could go to Southern Cal Midwinters. Say the wind's gone out. Yeah. Like ease everything out. You got to come up, John? Yeah. And when I first joined Richmond Yacht Club, I felt like I'd died and gone to heaven because all the people were so friendly. I don't know, the wives didn't particularly like, like me, but, uh, I got along with the husband, the skippers of boats. And in those days, women mainly went out on a boat to either bail or make sandwiches. We didn't have a shower in the ladies' head at Richmond Yacht Club. And one day we'd been out sailing and I came in and I had a couple of vodka martinis and I was wet and cold. And I decided that we'd had enough of the snow shower stuff. So I took my clothes and I marched into the men's head where there was a shower and took a shower. And we had a shower in the women's head within two weeks after that. Since at first there were no women sailing, there were no people competent to be crew. But as a little bit of time went on, there were women who sailed. So when there were women available to crew, I put together some women's crews and we had so much fun together. And I had never gotten along with women that well before, but I got along with these women. They were all wonderful, wonderful people. People say, what would you do differently? And I would say nothing. I'm glad I have a good life now. I'm still doing some sailing. Aim right for that white boat. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Thank you.
to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, live from the St. Francis Yacht Club. We have as our guest speaker today, Jocelyn Nash, who's only been sailing for 67 years. I said, I said, welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, live from the St. Francis Yacht Club. Uh, we have our speaker today, Jocelyn Nash, who's only been sailing for 67 years. And uh, seated next to her, uh, Jimmy DeWitt, her most significant long-term mentor, buddy, employer, and uh, dear brother. <laughs> if there's a non-genetic brother, Jimmy and Jocelyn are brother and sister. And her film biographer, Oleg Harankar, who is making a movie about her, the, the uh, preview of which, the little uh, trailer of which you just saw. Jocelyn, tell us, of all the 67 years that you've been sailing, Tell us about the most fun moment or a most fun moment, please. And with the mic. Boy, it was all so much fun. It's hard to pick out one moment. Winning the Mallory's. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> going, going with Jimmy to Mallory Cup. <laughs> Well, I always, I I always do what he says. <laughs> I I started working for Jimmy in about 1961, and he, as you all know, he's not only a sailor, a sailmaker, and a fantastic artist. And we were very much, uh, we were popular winners back there, and it was mostly because. Jimmy was really cute in those days. <laughs> we're we're going to take your word for this, Jocelyn. <laughs> yes. Well, I, I feel like I'm a good judge of cuteness in men. <laughs> but uh, I all want you all to be sure you know that the green boat that was featured in that is Cindy Delmas's boat. Cindy, stand up, please, my dear. Cindy? Cindy Domas. She said, thank you, Mom and Dad. And my dad went to grammar school with Jocelyn. Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, Jimmy, um, so this is a adorable, smart, uh, good sailing, uh, really, I don't want to say it, but I'm going to say headstrong woman. How was she as an employee? <laughs> she was great. She was my brains. Mike, Mike. Oh, Mike, can you hear me now? <laughs> uh, she was my brains. I, I would write uh, a, for, was it Bay and Delta? Yes. yes. Bay and Delta. And you could hardly understand what I had written. And she would take it. And, and she's a good writer. So then everybody thought I was a good writer. <laughs> I wasn't a good writer. <laughs> and she essentially ran the loft and told me when I should go race and put together the crew for me and sent me back to the Mallory's and there was something about a, a flying Dutchman. Yeah. She even went out and found a rich customer of ours to buy me a flying Dutchman <laughs> because I had been invited to sail in their nationals or, or the go, I was, I, I think. CC's my brains. Well, my brain is a lot older now. It's tired. Uh, but somebody did buy Jimmy a Flying Dutchman. And I think he went He went to Europe. Did you take the flying? Yes. Was the Flying Dutchman the boat that was caught in a strike at the Oakland? Yeah, yeah I couldn't take it. Yeah. So, uh, and, but Jim is very good at turning a bad situation into an opportunity because I think somehow he got another boat because he got to some races in Europe and I think that Jimmy was like first or second out of 80 or 100 boats. I should have won. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the committee got tired, and so they just wrote down a bunch of numbers when we all finished together. And I, 
I get a whole bunch of people around me. I say, well, that's not where I finished. No, that's not where you finished. You were way up there. I mean, <laughs> and I went to the committee to tell me. I said, oh, well, I'm never. So they got tired, but I won. <laughs> so, Oleg, uh, you've now uh, spent time with five of the great sailors in San Francisco Bay with your uh, series. Talk to us about the difference between Jocelyn, i.e. A, a woman, a female subject in your movies. How does she, how is she different? Um, she's not so full of herself as the rest of <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, 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 we are still working on the film, and I'm still learning, and we still have questions that we have not had answered. So I'm looking forward to um, completing that process. We are making a film about Jocelyn because so many people from the sailing community came to us and said, oh, you should do film about Jocelyn. First, uh, Millie Biller. Um, who said, I've known Jocelyn since I was 10 years old. She's always been my hero. You have to make a film about her. And uh, then others, including Commodore, who uh, said, oh, you know, you shouldn't keep making films about men. And if you are going to make a film about a woman, it should be Jocelyn. So uh, we can thank Commodore Tompkins for that great comment and good direction. There's been one of the series, one of the movies in the series was about Commodore. Nice to know and not surprising to hear him want to give credit to a uh, good female. His Nancy Potter is doing a great job uh, in, in their relationship. So thanks for acknowledging Commodore. Um, right. Speaking of questions, um, I want to ask Jocelyn a question. T tell us the story about freezing your mother-in-law's goldfish. Is it true, this legendary story? And what have you to say for yourself, Jocelyn? Freezing your mother-in-law's goldfish. Sure, that's easy to explain. Oh, before Gordy and I were married, his family lived at Ypsilanti, Michigan, and they invited me back there for a Christmas. And the bedroom that I was assigned had a goldfish bowl with a goldfish, it actually belonged to Gordon, to my brother-in-law, Beaver. And I, since I came from San Francisco Bay, I liked a lot of wind and cold in my bedroom. So I left the windows open, and uh, it got cold in the bedroom, and it froze, and it froze the fish, I mean. <laughs> That's not my happiest accomplishment. <laughs> oh, thank you for the explanation, Jocelyn. We've all been wondering. <clears throat> Jimmy, Jimmy, when was the first time you ever saw Jocelyn? Can you tell us the moment? No. <laughs> she, I, I told you she's my brains. When's the first time we met each other? <laughs> was it at the Yacht Club at Richmond? Yeah, we, we were at Richmond Yacht Club. And there had been some event, and then we went out and got something to eat afterwards. And uh, Jimmy, Jimmy had a had his first wife working for him, keeping books, and she also repaired sails. She was a beautiful, wonderful lady, but they weren't getting along so well. So after that, he asked me if I wanted a job. And it was about the time that I was getting tired of being home and being a, a dutiful wife and mother. And we needed a little more money. So I went to work part-time for Jimmy. So when, when, Jocelyn, did you get the idea of wearing a shower cap to go sailing? Oh, well, I got the idea for the shower cap a long time ago when they were trying to decide whether there would be the soling or the etchels in the Olympics, there was a, a lot of publicity for Skip Etchell's boat. And I saw a picture of Skip Etchell's wife. And she was a big, strong, efficient woman. And she even crewed on star boats. And she wore a shower cap. And I thought, well, if it's good enough for that lady, who is a real sailor, it'd be good enough for me. So I started keeping my 
hair under a shower cap. It keeps the uh, keeps the water and the hair out of your eyes. But the there was no no decent clothes for women in sailing back in those days. Nowadays, you can sail and look pretty nice, but in those days, it was terrible. So that was one of the things I think ultimately brought more women into sailing, the fact that they could look decent when they, when they were sailing. Jimmy. You think so far, everything you've heard about Jocelyn is she's very courageous. She is very courageous, but you haven't heard the last story. She decided to single hand to Hawaii to race the boat. I don't like myself well enough to go out there and be all alone by myself. <laughs> but she went out there, and something aloft broke. And she had to go aloft, as I recall, to try to fix something. And I, after it was all over, she decided, well, I'm not quite halfway there yet, so I think it's easier to get back than it is to keep going. So she's a smart lady. She came back. <laughs> Jocelyn, how do you go up the rig by yourself, single-handing, halfway across the Pacific? Well, Jimmy has embellished this story. <laughs> <laughs> and it's actually something I consider a failure in my life, and I don't much like talking about it. What I do remember about single-handing is I was very lonesome and there was a bunch of porpoises came along, and I wanted to talk to them so badly. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I just didn't prepare properly. I was working and getting the boat ready, and I should have waited two years. And so it's not something I'm very proud of. Jimmy. Another thing that we haven't talked about is how compassionate she is. She's a lovely lady, and she took care of a friend, Joe Guthrie, who got, had a stroke and uh, was in really bad shape and was in a wheelchair. And I don't know how many years she took care of Joe. It was quite a while. Seven, how long was it, Jocelyn? Four years. Four, Four years. Four years. So it was a very compassionate lady. Oleg, when you're shooting these other... Yes, acknowledgement. Thank you. Thank you, Jocelyn. Um, in shooting the other subjects, you went around and interviewed uh, different people. How many folks have you interviewed thus far to get background and information about our speaker today, Jocelyn? Oh, I talked to a lot of people and uh, you know, read everything number. we could find. Oh, I, I cannot give you a number. More than 10? More than 20? There's a lot of people in Richmond Yacht Club. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, when, when you when you sit down to shoot, uh, filmmakers are used to filming, you know, with shooting ratios where you have outtakes, outtakes, outtakes. You shoot so much more cinema verite and doc style. How was it different shooting her versus shooting the other subjects? Did you have to reshoot things? How were you rolling the camera with her versus the other subjects? No, it's it's about the same. Reality. Yeah. Uh, we do shoot a lot more than ends up in the film, obviously. Did she ever fall asleep during one of your sessions? No. <laughs> so I, I want to ask Jocelyn about that. Jocelyn, you've, you're infamous for having narcolepsy. And talk to us a little bit about that. I remember being a customer once on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, nar narcolepsy is an interesting affliction in which you, you just go to sleep, not in bed. You go to sleep at strange times. And everyone so Jimmy DeWitt kind of, kind of got tired of having me talk to a customer on the phone and then all of a sudden have to say, uh, or uh, who am I talking to, because I had fallen asleep. Uh, it, it, I remember sailing with somebody once, and... They were very disturbed because I was trimming the spinnaker in my sleep. But apparently I was doing a good job, too. <laughs> <laughs> no surprise. 
So how would you deal with the watch system, you know, when you'd go uh, offshore? Because it would be four on, two on, you know, four on, four off, and two people be on deck. What, were you able to control it during the time you were on watch, or how would you deal with it? Well, actually, narcolepsy kind of comes on when you're bored. And if I'm sitting there and somebody is talking and just droning on, talking slowly, slowly, <laughs> why that puts me to sleep. But, Would that explain why I so, know so much about it after our phone calls <laughs> during the 80s and 90s? <laughs> but uh, being on watch, actually, it's wonderful because I could go to sleep for 20 minutes and, and then get up and make some hot chocolate for everybody and then go watch and steer and have a marvelous time. So it was at sea, it was more of an asset than a disadvantage. When were you ever scared? Give us the, the most scary moment you can remember on a boat. Someone's asked me this before. And actually, the most scared I've ever been was the first time I went sailing. And I was, I was so scared on the Mercury that I would not take the helm unless I was sitting with my hand across Gordon Nash's thigh like that and for some reason that made me feel not quite as scared and he said that we had to take the jib down we didn't really know what we were doing and he, anyway he said we had to take the jib down and I don't know how we resolved that because I know I wasn't going to go up and take the jib down and if he went up and fell overboard we were both doomed I don't know how we worked it out but we're still here so <laughs> Oh, uh, being scared, I don't know, if you know what you're doing, you don't get scared, you just deal with it. And that's what's so great about sailing for women. You can use your brain to get out of a problem. Jimmy, uh, leading up to the Mallory, tell us the first time you thought about it and talk about Jocelyn's role in you deciding to leave the loft and go race to see if you could get a berth on the men's Amateur keelboat championship. It it's not, wasn't a keelboat. It was a uh, centerboard boat. Okay. And we had to eliminate here. Well, we had to do it at the club, but it, I don't know how we did that. But then the, our area eliminated down in South Bay, and it was in a thistle, and it was a mob jack when we went back to Annapolis. And uh, anyhow, it was all her idea. <laughs> she she thought all sail offs had a hot shot uh, skipper, Lowell North and Elfstrom and all these people. They had hot shot skippers. We got to make you a hot shot skipper. So <laughs> so she decided I should go back and in, into the North American Men Sailing Championship. So she arranged the whole thing. She arranged the crew. Uh, we had one crew that we won the eliminations in, with, and the other crew. Uh, we had to pick up because this guy had to go to work and he couldn't. So <laughs> we had uh, another one and he was brilliant. And she would not let that spinnaker collapse. She could concentrate. Boy, it would be on the edge every moment, but not collapse. If you want a good spinnaker trimmer, she's the one. <laughs> wow. <laughs> So we're going to ask questions of the audience, and if you have one, raise your hand. The mic will come to you. Um, Sally DeWitt. Uh -oh. Yes. No, 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 no question. I just um, I'm I'm thrilled to be here and uh, say how how much it meant to me in the '70s. For the most part, I went to work for the Sail Loft in 1971, and I was in my early 20s at the time. <clears throat> and Jocelyn. You know, there are several people that have been able, I've just been privileged to sail with in my life, including uh, Jim, of course. But Jocelyn just is a standout to me. And we we raced on uh, many boats, including El Gavilan and then um, uh, an Adams Cup series. And, and the thing that, that I remember from the Adams Cup series that we, we raced was we were on an Etchells, if I remember correctly, or maybe it was a Soling, down in uh, the Santa Cruz area. Remember with Trish, and what what I remember about that is that 
Jocelyn knew that the boat was set up for uh, men for the most part, but we were just three women. And uh, so she said, just like she she uh, mentioned earlier, was that you had to use your brains. I remember you telling us that, and and uh, just make it work. Uh, so we had to use our weight uh, coming out of attack or or something like that. And um, and timing was a lot. It was a lot about timing so that we could handle this boat. And uh, it was just fantastic. And the the confidence that. All of us got, you know, from Jocelyn. She knew that she could do it, and she gave us that confidence, and that translated into a lot of the rest of my life, certainly. So I'm I'm thrilled to stand here and and tr and you know say this uh, to you, Jocelyn. You've just been a fantastic. I just can't say it enough. I know there's a lot of a lot of other women in this group that have raced with Jocelyn, and I'm sure that they would say the same thing. So thank you very, very much. Could, could I see a peop, a lady, people who sail with Jocelyn stand up, please? Here we go. Wonderful. 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 Great. <clears throat> Another question, Cindy Lou. It's not working. Oh, it is working. So before I ask you to please tell the story that my dad told me about you in grammar school, which I know you know. Before I say that, I have tears welling up because I think I was seven, and I was uh, deaf. My sister and I were definitely the first girls in junior sailing at San Francisco Yacht Club. And I told my mom I wanted to be like that lady, Jocelyn Nash. I didn't know Jocelyn Nash, and I didn't know that my dad went to grammar school with Jocelyn Nash, but I wanted to be like Jocelyn Nash. And at that time, there was only four ladies racing in the whole Bay Area. And I am, I am me because of you, sweetie. Thank you so much. <laughs> story, tell the story. Commodore Sloat, when you ran for office. This is coming from my dad, Len Delmas, okay? Shh. <laughs> I'd love to tell, tell some stories on Cindy. Uh, no, uh, I was running for treasurer of the school, and we were like, what, 12 or 13 years old. And the way Lenny tells it, allegedly, what I said is my campaign speech, and I was allegedly wearing a pink Angora sweater. I can't imagine wearing such a thing. It sounds awful to me. <laughs> but anyway... In my pink Angora sweater, allegedly, I said, I'll give you two good reasons for electing me for treasurer. And uh, apparently, I, I was one of the, one of the few, few girls who had boobs in those days. <laughs> two, you, said, you said two good reasons. <laughs> one and two. <laughs> one and two. Uh -huh. Any other questions from the audience? So, Jimmy, while we're getting queued up with another question, uh, tell us, what, is, what did you think that Jocelyn was really best at doing on, on the boat? On, in the Mallory? You said trimming. Is it always trimming? Would you yes. like her for trimming? Mic oh, up. Oh, and keeping us all calm. Keeping us all calm. And uh, Jake was the brains. He was, a, he was an intellectual. Jake Van Eckeren, right? Your partner in those days. Yeah. No, he wasn't my partner. Oh, he wasn't your partner? No, at the same okay. time. No. Rewind that piece, okay. Not your partner. No, no. Your friend, colleague. Yeah. He was going to Stanford at the time. And one, one of the races, it, it fogged in after the start, and we couldn't tell where the weather mark was. I said, Jake, remember where the heading to that weather mark, and you make sure that when we get headed or lifted, we're on the proper tack, and time it how long we've been on each one, and you get us to that mark first. And son of a gun, if he didn't do it, he got to the weather mark first in the fog <laughs> by just being smart. <laughs> and I was smart enough to have him do it. <laughs> so in our, in our audience today, it's wonderful. We actually have um, mommy and baby. And the, this uh, young lady has a question. We'd love to hear from you. 
Hi, thank you so much for the inspiring talk today. I have a little bit of a selfish question. How did you balance being a mother and you know you didn't want to stay home with the kids all the time you want to go sailing? I can relate. How did you balance that with the sailing? Who looked after the kids? How did that all work? And he, the question was, the lady holding a baby at the back of the grill room wanted to know how you, how you uh, balance um, being a mommy and being a sailor. Yes. Bring up our questioner closer, John. Sometimes, sometimes I wonder. I, I, I know that my four children had, had a mommy, but it couldn't have been me. <laughs> <laughs> so when you worked in, when you worked in the business when you were in the sale loft of all the things that you did what did you like doing most in the business Jocelyn oh it was fun selling sales I, I loved talking to people and I mean I, I see so many people now and they say I sold them a sale in 1976 and making a connection with people and getting acquainted with them and finding out what they needed and why they needed something. And I, I also occasionally straightening out somebody. Back in when I started sailing, they were correcting weather helm by putting lead pigs in your boat. Oh if God. you can, can you imagine? I can't imagine any of you running around putting hunks of lead inside your boat nowadays. So helping, helping people if they say they have weather helm, you know, get them to let the main sheet out or how to depower the main and how to do all of that was the most fun. She was great at that, but don't let her near a sewing machine. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what did it feel like when you first introduced Gordy Jr., your now incredibly credentialed great young son, the sailor, when was the first time you saw him on a boat? Was it when you tied him to this transom of the Mercury? Oh, it seemed like he was there when we started sailing. Uh, Gordy was always on the boat, and sailing has been his life. And he was on El Toro's, and just, I don't know, Gordy could answer that question better. Um, let's see, Oleg. Um, thank you very much for being with us and for making a great movie about um, Jocelyn, which we look forward to seeing. When is it going to come out? We are not quite sure. <laughs> we are Ballpark in, a day. In the, uh, well, by the summer. By the summer, we hope. Summer. We, okay. We still have some fundraising to do and uh, some material we are still missing. It's very difficult to um, get photographs on Jocelyn. You know, she, she has not, she's not one of those people who just keeps a lot of photographs and hands it to you and you come, so. How did you get the photos? We have uh, like 90 photos that, we sh that Jocelyn used earlier that you gathered. How'd you gather those up and by what sources? From what sources? Um, some from people from Richmond Yacht Club. Um, the, the big lucky strike was when Tim Nash, the youngest son, managed to uh, convince father Gordon Nash Sr. to uh, let us uh, uh, have the family albums. So a lot of the early photographs that you saw today came from family um, albums. There were these tiny, tiny photographs in, like they used to take back in those days, which we were able to enlarge. Jimmy, thanks very much. Jim DeWitt, Mallory Cup winner, uh, Masters winner, and inspiration and original mentor of Jocelyn. Jimmy, thank you for coming. And Jocelyn, thank you very much uh, for, uh, for being here today and making yourself available for the movie to inspire so many young women. And uh, thank you for attending the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon live from the St. Francis Yacht Club. And with that, the luncheon is adjourned. Wonderful.